something like ball ball. Hi, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Now, you may have noticed that our title music was just a little bit different. We asked you, of course, to send in your remixes of our theme using SoundCloud. Now, we received many submissions and what you just heard was DJ Vivek's version. So, well done to DJ Vivek. You'll uh, see his Twitter handle on our screen. Let's move on to the show now. Today, we look at one group taking on a powerful Mexican drug cartel and why hashtags created by the black community are so popular. Our digital producer Ahmed Shehabedin is back on the couch looking out for all your feedback. Ahmed, you were away for a couple of days at the Google Zeitgeist conference in Arizona. How yeah. was it? It was, uh, it was inspiring. It was definitely an eclectic group of people. There was even uh, the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice O'Connor was there, Lady Gaga's manager, but all sorts of people innovating in different industries. I'm sorry, what was that? Lady Gaga's manager. Lady Gaga's manager. <laughs> An impressive fellow. Interesting. Good conversation. Yeah, good conversations. Uh, just talking about innovation in mm. different you know, industries, but also there was a focus on the media and social media. And, and you gave a presentation as well. Yes, I spoke briefly for... Uh, about 10 minutes about the reclaiming the Arab identity mm. through the context of this uh, Arab uprising or Arab I noticed a whole lot of people started unfollowing us after your speech. Well, perhaps. No, perhaps. just kidding. No, well, welcome, welcome back. Good Thanks. to have you back you. on the Orange Couch. Now, Alexander Leung is also with us next to Ahmed on the hey. Orange Couch. He's the founder and CEO of SoundCloud. That's now, true. SoundCloud was, was used to create that remix, and people are playing around with our theme music, sent us some fascinating sub submissions. Does yeah. it make you really proud to, to hear that? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's like, I think, um, you know, every, on, every day when we see somebody doing something very cool and interactive like that with SoundCloud, it's something that sort of reminds us why we actually did it. Like, I mean, in this case, taking theme song from something you may watch and then sort of remaking it into your own version and then actually hearing that back and broadcast, mm. I think is a pretty cool experience. But SoundCloud is not just about music, is it? No, that's right. It's like we were about any kind of sound out there. <clears throat> we're a social sound platform, so it really is everything from um, Lady Gaga, mm -hmm. big, big artists using it, to um, authors recording their books, uh, a lot of news organizations, and anybody from you know walking down the street who wants to record some audio commentary or share their voice with the world. So it's really about all kinds of sound. Do you think there was a focus on, on video and, and images for far too long and perhaps um, people just may have ignored or disregarded the sound element? Yeah, I think you're completely right. I mean, I think we were really lucky in that both my co-founder and I, we love sound and somehow the world sort of almost forgot about sound, so mm -hmm. now we can reintroduce that to the web. Okay. Um, it should have happened previously, but we're making it happen now. Okay, great. Look forward to your contribution uh, throughout the program, particularly in the latter half of the program, because I know you've got some fascinating insight up ahead. Welcome right. once again to the Looking show. Looking forward to it. Now, uh, don't forget, you can tell us what stories matter to you. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Just follow us on Twitter and send a tweet with the hashtag AJStream. We could feature your suggestion in a future episode. My name is Brandon Littman. I'm the co-founder of One Day on Earth. We film the world in a day, and I'm in the stream. Now, as Mexican drug cartels fight to gain control of the lucrative drug trade, violence has engulfed the country. According to the Mexican government, nearly 40,000 people have been killed in the past five years alone as a result of the drug war. Let me give you an example of the cartels and where they oper uh, operate in uh, Mexico. Let me zoom into this map that I have, uh, our source is Stratfor, the intelligence um, unit there, the think tank. As you can see over here, you've got this belt over here in this part of the country in uh, the pinkish or reddish color. That's where the Zetas cartel operates. That's where they're really influential. And over here in the green, the other uh, major cartel, the Sinaloa cartel in green, that's where they operate. But as you can see, looking at, looking at all the different colors, uh, Mexico as a country really heavily affected by the um, different organizations and the different activities of the drug cartels over there. Well, the state of Veracruz has become increasingly dangerous in the last few years. 
after falling under the control of that violent Zetas cartel. Now, there's a group by the name of Mata Zetas, or Zetas Killers, or Kill Zetas, and they've emerged claiming they're going to rid society of the cartel. No eludimos nuestras responsabilidades, pero solo peleando en igualdad de condiciones se podrá lograr erradicar de raíz al cártel de los Zetas. Y por el cual, para el efecto, pedimos que los funcionarios y autoridades que apoyan a los Zetas dejen de hacerlo. Que las Fuerzas Armadas estén ciertas que nuestro único objetivo es acabar con el cártel de los Zetas. Que la sociedad en general esté segura y confíe que nosotros, los Matacetas, no extorsionamos, no secuestramos y nunca afectaremos el patrimonio personal ni de la nación. Well, the style of the video definitely reminiscent of other groups elsewhere in the world. Many believe this group is actually a facade for an opposing cartel, the Sinaloa perhaps. So let's try to find out who are they really. Joining us now via Skype from the El Paso Juarez border in Mexico is Alfredo Corchado, the Mexico Bureau Chief of the Dallas Morning News. Thanks a lot uh, for joining us, Alfredo. Uh, My pleasure. Demystify Metazetas for us and, and what they stand for. Well, it's a, it's a paramilitary group uh, for all intents and purposes. It's made up of uh, other cartels, including the Sinaloa cartel, the Gulf cartel, local authorities, and some intelligence officials suggest that even members of the military. Uh, and, and the goal, it's very clear, it's, you know, get rid of the Zetas. Uh, they, they first appear earlier this year in the state of Jalisco, but since then they have moved their, their, their cry to the, or the battlefield to uh, Veracruz. Officially, the government says they reject any sort of, sort of form of vigilantism, but uh, would you dispute that? I think officially that's, that's what they're saying, but we're seeing in other regions, uh, including Monterey, where people are fed up with the lack of, uh, of response from the government or their lack of being able to, to rid themselves of the setas uh, or other cartels, and they're taking matters into their own hands. Um, I don't think they have a choice but to officially, you know, uh, denounce them. It's interesting that you say people are fed up because dipping into social media, we see people, some, you know, showing support uh, for Meta Setas, saying, yes, you know, the government has done nothing for so many years, so many people have died as a result of this drug war, not just with the Zetas, but with the Sinaloa and with uh, others, and they don't believe President uh, Calderon's policies are the right policies in this uh, drugs war. You also see, you know, people saying these guys are vigilantes, they're thugs, they're, they're just like all the other paramilitaries. How important is it uh, as a journalist for you to tap into the bloggosphere and the Twitter sphere to, to, to gauge not only the information from the ground, but also popular sentiment? Uh, and is there perhaps an absence uh, of, of uh, traditional sources engaging the pulse of the people? Well, it's extremely important. Uh, this is the fifth year in this, into this campaign. More than 40,000 people have been killed. The sad thing is that there are regions in, throughout Mexico where they're, they're basically regions of, of silence. Uh, where we don't have access to really what's going on in these areas. Uh, for a while, we relied on, on local newspapers. They come, have come out and, and basically said, look, we're self-censoring ourselves. We're not reporting anything that has to do with cartels. Lately, uh, so, you know, after the, uh, after the official media decided to self-censor themselves, we, we turned to bloggers and citizen uh, journalists in the last two weeks, uh, three people have been decapitated or, or their bodies mangled. And that further silences these communities. So it's an extremely tough situation uh, to try to explain to our readers what is actually going on in Mexico. Uh, Alfredo, on that point, you know, we're talking about the power or the usage of social media. I want to share with you something Vanessa Niera Soto says. She says, I think on on Facebook. She says, I think that the Matazeta video is a ploy to get us to calm down, especially people living in Veracruz. And then she goes on to say, the Zetas have been killing people that inform of their doings for a while, only before it was against journalists. 
The only thing that's changed is some people, as we just discussed, are taking to Twitter and Facebook um, you know, to talk about it, something that the media has ignored. And then at the end, she says, in my humble opinion, the Matazeta video is a political stunt to try to calm the waters in Veracruz, perhaps insinuating the government's involved. I mean, can you conceivably see that this is a political stunt? Well, you know, there's a lot of speculation in Mexico that uh, this is an election year. Uh, the, the, the presidential election is next July 2012. So that there's, you know, you, you have to understand that there's a lot of cynicism, there's a lot of skepticism. Uh, there is a sense that the Mexican government in the last two, three months has basically, is, is waging war on the setas, they're going after them. Uh, there's also a sense that the setas themselves are trying to create as much havoc as possible so that when the new president comes in, they can have some kind of leverage to try to either find some kind of escape or find some accommodation with, with wherever the new government is. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot of, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of conspiracies on, on whether or not the government is involved or, or another, maybe another political party is involved to try to make the current government, the Felipe Calderon administration, look badly so that uh, they lose the elections next year. Uh, Alfredo, a couple of decades ago, we saw the emergence of right-wing paramilitaries in Colombia, uh, paramilitaries which uh, in many instances were state-sponsored, at least state-approved in many ways because their um, purpose was to fight the FARC rebels. Um, in Mexico, you have a country awash with, with guns. You have a country uh, filled with these cartels. Is there a danger, do you feel, that you might have a sort of Colombia moment with more and more paramilitaries emerging, whichever side they, they're fighting for? That's definitely the, the biggest concern, that uh, we're taking an, uh, another step lower and following the, the Colombian example. And the danger with, with that is that, uh, yes, you may, you, know, you may start going after the number one enemy, which in this case I think a, a lot of people agree are, are the setas, but eventually they become you know, uh, another group of killers. And as in the case of Colombia, they end up controlling the, uh, the, the cartel market or the, the drug market. Um, the big difference, as you pointed out, between Colombia and Mexico is that Mexico shares a 2,000-mile border with the United States. You have thousands of gun shops right along the, the U.S.-Mexico border. So, you know, with that kind of firepower, mm -hmm. paramilitaries running around, uh, allegedly going after cartels, it just makes the situation that much more dicey for, yeah, for yeah. Mexicans and Americans. It paints an ominous picture. Alex, you want to come in there? Yeah, sure. I was, I was curious, like, when I was looking at this from um, what had happened now, I, I was curious on, on your thoughts if, if you think that, you know, these organizations have gotten more sophisticated in that this is not just, uh, just an announcement getting the word out there. There's actually, you know, a second step of get, going out with an announcement against a group that people are currently scared and, and sort of troubled by, which sort of spawns this massive uh, reaction and support from the people in the community. And I was wondering if, if you sort of, if you think this is an attempt to try and rally, uh, rally people around a sort of somewhat, not a positive cause, but, a, but more of a positive message to go more against the current government, or if that's sort of too, too thought through. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a big, big concern because, you know, a, a big difference between Colombia and Mexico today is that you didn't have the, uh, the use of, of the social media. Uh, so by doing that, they're also trying to win support by residents, but to what end? I mean, that's really the question that a lot of people are asking. Uh, how are they trying to help, you know, the overall situation in Mexico? Right. All that Mexicans care about at this point is that the violence, the level of violence continues to go up. Uh, it, right, you know, I'm, I'm in El Paso right now, right across Ciudad Juarez. The numbers of uh, people killed a, a day have gone down from 8 to, I think, 5.7 mm -hmm. a day. Uh, but the, the wave of violence has spread throughout other parts of Mexico. So I think at this point, people are just exasperated and, and trying to figure out what's next. Alfredo, on that point of exasperation, we have Ibrahim Daji saying, the cartels don't abide by the law, so someone has to teach them a lesson through violence, hence the vigilantes. Now, you know, we've talked about the government's failures, and the government, you could argue, has failed to a certain extent. 
Would you agree with this sentiment that perhaps uh, maybe it's not the government that will be able to, as this person's saying, teach them a lesson? Uh, you know, it, you, you live in a country, I live in a country in Mexico, where 98% of all crimes are unsolved. And that's a huge message. I mean, you can commit murder and get away with it. So there is a sense that, you know, the government is not doing enough. Someone else has to step in. But again, uh, if, again, if you look at the example of Colombia and other countries, these groups can get out of hand. It can get a lot worse. And, and we've been seeing that steadily throughout the, the last few years in Mexico, where things continue to get worse. Now, with the uh, rise of paramilitary groups, uh, you know, where, where, where does this take you? Mm -hmm. Alfredo, great point. And unfortunately, we have run out of time. I wish we can uh, dedicate another show to look at the root causes, perhaps, of the drug war, the issues of, of demand across the border in the United States and elsewhere. I think that's even another discussion. But uh, for the moment, it was great to pick your brain and to get some insight on the Zetas and the Meta Zetas in Mexico. Alfredo uh, Corchado, questions? all the best. Thank you very much. Well, uh, don't forget you can read more about this story on our website, stream.aljazeera.com. You'll find videos, tweets, and other multimedia elements there. According to the Moroccan state agency, seven people were killed on Tuesday in violence that erupted after a football match in the country's disputed Western Sahara region. Abdel Fattah Mohammed alerted us to this story on Twitter. Now let's look at, at his tweet right here. He says, Western Sahara's conflict erupts in violence on the soccer pitch. And he links to an article. Now we've learned that two policemen were among those killed and dozens injured during the riots that broke out in Dakhla. Sahrawi activists have been seeking independence for Western Sahara for decades now, and they claim that the government is bringing in Moroccan loyalists to change Western Sahara's demography or its demographic makeup in an attempt to prevent the independence movement. But on Twitter, Lahsen Haddad says this simple football rival rivalry is being manipulated by the Polisario Front, which is the rebel movement fighting for independence from Morocco. Let's have a look. He says, incidents between supporters of two soccer teams in Dakhla is exploited by Polisario hackers for political purposes. And there are the two hashtags right there, Western Sahara and Sahara Libra, if you want to follow this story. Now, we have one more video that came into us that was shared by Khalil Asmar on Twitter. Uh, he claims to document that this video documents what happened in Dakhla on Tuesday. He writes, this is not Syria at the top of the tweet. Uh, this is occupied Western Sahara where Morocco's army is firing to disperse the crowds. Now, I'm just going to play this video to give you a sense of what's going on right there. According to local residents, the clashes reportedly began with youth throwing stones and escalated when Sahrawi activists joined in. Now, there are reports that police used tear gas to restore calm and that troops were eventually deployed in two of Dakhla's neighborhoods. Morocco's interior ministry eventually ordered an inquiry, inquiry rather, into the violence. Now, just for a bit of context, Morocco and the Polisaria Front have fought a 25-year-long war that ended in 1991 with a United Nations brokered ceasefire. So remember, you too can share these kinds of stories with us in the form of tweets, videos, photos, uh, or even perhaps SoundCloud uh, audio formats. Um, so suggest your hashtags for us to follow on Twitter and tell us the stories that you are following. Hi, I'm Anya. I'm researching on digital diplomacy and I'm in the street. Now, hashtags that begin in the African-American community have turned into comedic one-liners that trend beyond U.S. borders. The hashtags, or black tags, as they've been dubbed by some, tend to be simple and easy to relate to, although many consider them downright racist. For example, the hashtag, somewhere in the hood, became extremely popular worldwide within a matter of hours. Let's take a look at some of the responses to that so-called black tag. Let me read a few to you from our Storyfy over here. Here's one at a McDonald's. Somewhere in the hood, there's an angry black lady taking somebody's order just beneath it. Uh, somewhere in the hood, there's a mother working hard to ensure that her children don't become a product of their environment like my moms did. And then there's, let me just read you a third one. Somewhere in the hood, the police are harassing someone who is just walking to the Chinese store. That one from Taisha. Uh, Edwards 
10 over there. So what is it about these hashtags that makes them trend? Why are we even having this discussion? I mean, this is worthwhile asking. Joining us now via Skype to shed some light is Latoya Peterson, the editor of Racialicious, a site that explores the intersection of race and pop culture. Latoya, thanks a lot <laughs> uh, for joining us. We're uh, a fairly multicultural team here on the stream, and we were debating this for about a day and a half as to how to approach this topic as well and whether it was worth <laughs> covering. Do you think that that is revealing in itself? It is, because it's such an awkward conversation to have. Um, the whole idea of delineating Twitter into black and then I suppose non-black or white or regular usage. Um, it's really awkward to think about it in those terms. But at the same time, there are cultural differences. The problem is that a lot of the media conversations and a lot of the ways that Twitter users have been responding to it have been uh, somewhat racially loaded, which is what makes the topic hard to discuss. Yeah, of course, there was that Farhad Manju piece in Slate uh, magazine. It was called How Black People Use Twitter, and it was really yes. divisive and controversial. I mean... As a, as a straightforward question, do you believe that there's anything unique to the way African Americans use Twitter and, and why these memes uh, stem from predominantly African American hashtags or hashtags that were started by African Americans? Well, the first thing to understand is that African American culture isn't a monolith. And we see that repeated on Twitter. So there's plenty of African Americans who use Twitter in, you know, the quote, regular way. Um, in this idea that, uh, you know, you can use Twitter to have different types of cultural exchanges or to do very different things with it, that's definitely a slightly younger demographic, a more teenage demographic, um, and someone who's definitely not necessarily super into technology in the way that early adopters would be, but are still very heavily into usage and technology. And they're kind of creating their own language around it. So what people are calling black Twitter or what Bartunde Thurston likes to call blitter is really a subset of black activity on Twitter. So it's not even representative of a black hole in itself entirely. Let's bring Alex in here just, as, uh, just before Ahmed goes into some feedback. Alex, you wrote a book on the sociology of all of this and actually studying this. Are we having a, a vacuous and, and irrelevant conversation or is this fodder? Do we have mm. the raw materials of a really highbrow discussion that we can actually read into uh, social trends with? Yeah, well, maybe first a disclaimer. The book wasn't specifically about this, but sort of, it had of sociology, it, yeah. online sociology. So, so I think, I mean, there's, there's two different things going on, right? One is the actual behavior on Twitter itself. Um, you know, there from the beginning when it was something very small, it was it was a very, um, you know, very small uh, cultural group that mm -hmm. sort of used it. It came from sort of early adopter, um, early adopter tech crowd, and I think you know it's it's we've seen it explode. Was that into, predominantly, for want of a better word, culturally white? Right. Yeah, that would probably right. be the case. Um, and you know, we've seen it explode into to many other other places. And you know, I think the 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 usage of of other sort of cultural groups um, using Twitter for how they want to use it, that's a really, that's just a great thing in itself, right? But I think that the discussion here is a little bit more around how people were talking about the fact afterwards. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a, it's a cool thing that there's a new way that people use, um, use Twitter and the, that those hashtags trend really fast. I mean, that's a very powerful yeah. thing. That's a behavior that wasn't in the service from the beginning, which probably wasn't planned by the yeah. people who created the service but that has now become massive. And there's a certain group that sort of tends to have more influence in that at the moment. Okay, let's bring Ahmed in for some feedback. Just want to get a couple quick tweets mm. in here. Uh, Iron Chariots on Twitter is saying, one reason many people are unhappy with such hashtags is because they reveal uncomfortable truths about our society and race. And I'll just mention when I was living in Europe, you know, there was an overt racism sometimes that even I would encounter, Latoya. And when I came to the US, I noticed that sometimes it was more subtle. Um, and we have another tweet where someone says it won't be long before what people steal, ha white people steal hashtags or take credit for them. Very quickly, do you think, uh, what do you think about that last tweet? Um, it's fascinating because there's this appropriation of kind of what's going on in black Twitter in that weird way that other things have been exoticized um, all throughout history and all throughout change. But at the same time, I also wonder how much longer uh, black Twitter is going to function as this thing outside of Twitter, considering how popular it is. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be that special if it's the mainstream way of communicating on Twitter. Okay, Latoya, thanks for your thoughts. Stay with us because we'll continue this discussion in the post show for our online viewers. Alex, thanks for joining us for our TV viewers. You'll be Thank seated you so in the orange couch for the post show.
Uh, join us in the post show. We'll continue this conversation. Stream.aljazeera.com. We'll leave you with some more of DJ Vivex. Remix. <laughs> Welcome back to the post show. Stream.aljazeera.com is where the conversation is ongoing. Ahmed, you've been, uh, you've got a lot of feedback to go through. And unfortunately, I relegated you to the last little okay. corner of uh, the show. Uh, plenty to look at. Mm -hmm. Give us some more uh, insight from what we're receiving from the community. Well, just on that la last note, um, uh, you know, we have this tweet from Jonas. He says, is there a study including black people outside the U.S.? If not, it would be speculation. Okay. Now, I'm not entirely sure what he, he's referring to, but perhaps he's referring to the fact that uh, it's speculative just to discuss that there are these tweets that are black tweets or, you know, black... Well, that, that's tweets. interesting. I mean, let's, uh, how about we pose that to Latoya? I hope she's still there with us. Latoya, the fact that, as you said, there's, this is a, a subsection of uh, black culture and it's a subsection of African-American culture, in a way. Uh, some people are asking us on Twitter... Uh, we're saying black, but we're only perhaps only referring to the United States. What about blacks elsewhere? That's exactly correct. Like one of the articles that I wrote about this early on, where I interviewed um, someone from Edison Research who broke that initial study that Twitter was about 25% black, um, they had noticed uh, that that was not something that they intended to cover in the study. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they didn't put any controls in the place, they didn't try to measure, they didn't try to figure it out. It was this very strange anomaly that became very, very important. Um, but at the same time, they didn't have a lot of data around it. They didn't break anything down. They didn't ask about the diaspora. So we have no idea. Alex, do you think uh, Twitter and the issue of race, particularly as things trend, things that are very uh, racially specific in terms of humor and, and nuance, do you think these things have the, uh, the potential to, to be very divisive, the potential to cause trouble, perhaps? Um, I think they, I mean, they do. Like, it, it, any open communication system has, you know, has the power to, to um, help cause trouble, I think. Um, I think it's important to not get overly alarmed about those usages of, of a, an open system. You know, I, I think also just us as humans, we're, we're naturally drawn to, um, to sort of conflict and, and yeah. uh, things like that. So, so I think these new types of, of hashtags that are, um, that are controversial, they sort of, they pull people in and they want, to, um, they, people want to comment on them. I think hopefully, you know, we'll all, we'll all find some other, uh, other kind of hashtags as well that mm. will sort of float up there. So the top trending hashtags aren't always controversial. But, uh, but Ahmed, I mean, there are other uh, hashtags uh, like, you know, you know your Muslim when, or you know your Arab right. when, or you, you, yeah. you know your Indian when. I mean, th this is just, th there's a multitude of these. So these aren't, you know, this is not the first time that somebody's ever heard of these very cultural, culture-specific hashtags yeah. that have emerged. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know if this is extrapolating it too far, and yeah. I'm not trying to have too much of an intellectual conversation. The reason I say that is because Alex Moon on Twitter pointed out, uh, you know, maybe jokingly saying, t talking about black <laughs> tags, trying to turn it into an intellectual discussion. But I think it's true and important to note that online, you know, especially on these platforms, um, people feel a lot more comfortable discussing these kinds of things or, or you know, claiming things like this, discussing race, not just because of the anonymity that's involved, mm -hmm. but also because, you know, you feel as though uh, it's, it's not as uh, uncomfortable because you're sitting alone and you're, you're perhaps typing something. And, and even though you're relating to a wide group of people, mm -hmm. um, there's less awkwardness. I, I joke often without, you know, again, digressing. Uh, I often tell people, I say, that's racist when people do things or say things that's not racist mm. in this country just so that we can start to have a conversation around it. So if someone says, oh, it's freezing in here, I'll say that's racist. And even if there's no correlation to it potentially being racist, you'll notice that people will, um, you know, for a, a second quiver or second guess themselves. They'll so recoil. I think, and I think that's the thing yeah. like, with, with Twitter. Like, I mean, in real life, you can tell the, those things of when it's a joke and when it's not. Exactly. And on Twitter, you just can't. Yeah. Like, and people feel free free to say what they want. It is, again, a little bit that. I would wonder what Latoya thinks. Do you think it's anonymity that people feel so comfortable labeling things and talking about these things online as opposed to in real life? 
Right. Plus, there aren't the same consequences online. Like there are some, but it's not the same as saying something really racist in front of your coworker or a good friend, uh, <laughs> yeah. where they might recoil from you or not want to talk to you. At the same time, some of these, you know, quote black tags are really interesting because all people participating aren't necessarily black. And yeah. when you look at people's uh, avatars, considering if that's their real representation, um, a lot of different people seem to really enjoy those. So I would wonder how much. Um, of the black Twitter tags are being perpetuated by black Twitter users or are they just being adopted in? Latoya, you know, interestingly, I remember on Facebook a couple of years ago, I made a joke uh, about Hosni Mubarak, who at that time was still the president of Egypt. And uh, there, was, there was an interesting parallel between perhaps, and this is me just extrapolating, between how Egyptians responded to this joke I had made about Mubarak and almost the way African Americans respond to any jokes regarding the n-word so it was almost as if we are allowed to make fun of mubarak but you are not and right. and uh, you know mm -hmm. i was I, they clamped down upon me for making this joke about mubarak and they said oh this is you know insensitive and it's wrong and you you hate egyptians etc and i said well, i'm just i'm lampooning the leader as, as a joke and it reminded me of the the different cultural sensitivities when it comes to uh, the n-word particularly here and that uh, many African Americans feel that only they can use it, whether it's in a, a joking or, or a context or not. Uh, we're going to see these fault lines emerge as people opt into each other's discussions, aren't we? Right. I mean, it's one of those things where it's kind of the death of the in-house conversation, <laughs> where if you're having these conversations publicly, you can't assume that everyone reading will be black or everyone reading will be Egyptian or Arab or whatever. You're going to have to know that there's going to be some drift in these conversations. And people who are of your community may understand the context, but others may not. And that does change how we speak or how we might engage in these spaces. Okay. Ahmed? Just something very quickly to note. Um, I don't know what this means. Perhaps it means nothing. But we often post on Facebook what we're going to be discussing on the show, and we almost always have people commenting on these posts. Um, we posted that we were going to be discussing, you know, these hashtags, and we did have, you know, we posted this four hours ago, and we did have 16 people like the posts, and yet no one has commented. So perhaps <laughs> dispelling everything we just discussed about people <laughs> feeling uh, comfortable discussing these things online. I, th <laughs> I thought I'd just include that for us right there. OK, Latoya, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank was, you for having uh, me. It was good to have your thoughts. And uh, uh, this is a discussion that, that doesn't really have a beginning, middle, or end. But it's nice to just bring <laughs> these things up, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Latoya Peterson joining us there. Uh, let's just uh, move on very quickly. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to give you an update on a story that we have been uh, following regarding uh, train crashes in China. There has been another subway collision, and Ahmed, uh, social media sites, particularly Sina Weibo in, in China, mm -hmm. a buzz with angry people, angry at their government because they feel that, A, the, right. the, the railways are not entirely safe, mm -hmm. and B, they're not getting the full amount of information from their government. It's true. And, uh, you know, what's really interesting is that I think it's within, what, eight weeks now? This is the second time that it's happened. And mm -hmm. as you know, on social media sites, which is a relatively new advent in the country, uh, people are really concerned about this because mm -hmm. the Chinese government, I think, has championed, in a sense, um, you know, their, their transportation system and mm -hmm. their success as, like, you know, as a reason as to why people should continue to support them. And people are wondering, you know, you know are people, are the, is the Chinese government investing more in their economic growth rather than the safety or the interests of their people? And I just quickly, if I can, I hope it's here. Yeah. There was a great image. Um, I can't find it right now, but I'll just briefly reference it in the Globe and Mail, mm -hmm. which showed, I think, the six leading newspapers in China and that only one of them, um, I'll be able to pull it up in a second, w w mentioned this on the front page. Oh, wow. I think it was the China Daily. Mm -hmm. The rest were talking about how the Prime Minister of North Korea was coming to China. So people feel that there's a big divide, frankly, between what's being discussed on social media and the traditional media in China. Alex? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it inter it's interesting. It again shows, you know, that um, I was having a conversation with somebody about how a, a lot of social media and, and our communications have shifted into a networked world, right? But um, government and to a certain degree media is still in a centralized world. And I think when something like this happens, it's a great thing of, of people to be able to get the word out that, you know, we're not happy with this. Like, we don't, uh, we don't think that the government is doing what they should to be able to get our transport to work. And, you know, it causes, um, it causes it, the discussion to pop up, and now it becomes obvious that the media there isn't covering it in, in the way that it should. 
Um, and you know, it just shows people's actual concerns for this. And I think that that gives that network gives people a lot more power. And, and there's a network, despite the fact that the traditional Western tools, right, the Facebooks and uh, uh, Facebooks and Twitters and uh, Google's mm -hmm. and SoundClouds uh, and SoundClouds. <laughs> you, SoundCloud works in China, doesn't it? Yes, it yeah. does. <laughs> so my point was that the Facebooks are are, are not readily ac uh, accessible by Chinese, but they use other avenues like Sina Weibo and, and other right. video sharing ways. Yep. Yeah. Which which kind of shows that this is not specific to the tools that were created in exactly. the West. Exactly. I mean, it's a different layer, right? You yeah. Have, you have sort of the, the actual, the, the internet infrastructure, which is built as an open network kind of platform. The inherent architecture of it supports that. And then you, then you have applications like Twitter and stuff on top of it. I mean, you can build different kinds of applications, but the truly powerful ones make use of that sort of networked architecture, the inherent sort of properties of the internet. Okay. And I think that sort of that sips into like how people organize themselves, how they spread information, and you know that's um, it becomes extremely powerful. Okay. And I just uh -huh. wanted to quickly reference what I was talking about yeah. earlier. Um, this was actually this image was assembled by a, a Shina Weibo user, which you know again is just meant to highlight the disparity between. What China's main newspapers were showing today, as you can see there, a head of state visits uh, China and so on and so forth. And there's only one new one newspaper that showed, um, you know, what everyone is discussing, whether mm. it's online or probably in the streets or in public life. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting that you know even these discrepancies are being pointed out on the very tools that are discussing and mm. documenting what's happened. In yeah, China. a lot more to be to, to be said about this, and uh, we will be talking. China tomorrow, in fact, so I hope you can join us for that. Alexander Leung, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. For and uh, I'll be checking out SoundCloud. Um, don't expect me to make any music. No, but uh, you can record your thoughts. You know, yeah. I know you have lots of great thoughts. Record a few them accents. Share them with the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those ones got those. those. Impersonations. <laughs> yeah, impersonations. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. Good to have you on the Orange Couch. Hope to uh, see you soon. Cool. Thank you so much. Ahmed, welcome back. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thanks for watching the stream. In a couple of hours' time, this entire episode will be reposted, so you can watch it again at stream.aljazeera.com or at youtube.com forward slash Al Jazeera English. Thanks for watching. Bye.